Welcome to Establishing Shots, the podcast about the art, craft and business of filmmaking. I'm Nick Hilton. My guest on today's podcast is Mark Jenkin, the writer-director and numerous other roles of a film called Bait. Bait has been a smash hit, something that it wouldn't look like on paper, I don't think. Black and white with the sound dubbed in post, it's the story of a Cornish fisherman and his struggle with modernisation and gentrification. It's also won Mark a BAFTA and has been championed by Mark Kermode as one of the best British films of the decade. So I was very grateful that Mark could speak to me from his home in Cornwall. So, Mark, Bait is obviously a really kind of idiosyncratic piece, a sort of very kind of clear vision. How did you first come to realise that you wanted to make the film Bait? Was it something that your whole career had been building up towards or was it something that you sort of saw as a standalone project, you just had a particular vision for it? Um, I suppose it comes ask that question with two answers really in two in two parts because the the first when the film started it came out of an idea that I pitched to a friend of mine I was in Cornwall in the summer of 1999 making a a film with my mates I I was I was living in London at the time and I came home in the summer of 1999 because I was a bit homesick in London to make a film about me and my mates growing up on the north coast of Cornwall and while I in the making of that film, I, um, I had a lot of conversations with a friend of mine um, called Nick Dark, who's actually the dad of my mate Jim, who was in the film, who I was making the film with. And we actually ended up using Nick and Jane, who's Jim's parents, using their house for a lot of the locations in the filming. And Nick, um, who sadly passed away in 2005, he's a playwright. He's a f- fisherman and a, and a and a and quite a famous playwright, certainly. Um, you know, very well known in Cornwall and very outspoken on a lot of the issues with Cornwall, including like the Cornish political questions, Cornish identity, culture, industry, all of that kind of stuff. So I, I started pitching this idea to him of making a film that was about a fisherman who provoked a civil war within his community by daring to question um, how the tension between industry and trade so fishing and tourism how that tension could ever be resolved if people weren't discussing the underlying frustrations and resentments that were at the heart of the community and he was really encouraging of me to to develop that and and I developed it into this film over the next few years which was called The Holiday Park which was about a fisherman who was about my age at the time so mid to late 20s who picked up a video camera, got lent a video camera, decided to make a video diary of his way of life just as a record. But in the act of creating this video diary, realized that his way of life was being compromised and the camera became this catalyst for all of this tension to, to bubble over within, within the village. So it, it was really about form. It was about the role of a camera and what that can do. Um, and then a few years ago, Apple bought out the iPhone which destroyed the idea of any uh, of the fact that somebody could have a camera and it have any kind of impact anywhere as a you know because everybody's wandering around filming everything and nobody really notices it anymore so it sort of destroyed the form of that film and I put it on the shelf Nick had passed away by then uh, the producer I've been developing the film with sadly she passed away very quickly as well so the project became something that I just sort of put aside and worked on other things and then in it, about four or six years ago, I suppose, I, I decided I was going to go back to shooting film, which is how I'd started out. I'd started out shooting Super 8 films and then moved on to shooting mini DV and then followed the sort of digital path as technology got it moved on a pace. And I had sort of fallen out of love with filmmaking a little bit and thought I'm going to buy a Super 8 camera and go back to shooting on film and hand processing film and, and taking real photographs again and all that kind of stuff. And a friend of mine, a producer called Denzel Monk, who's based down here, I, I pitched an idea to him saying, well, how about we make a, a short narrative film, shoot it on the Bolex, shoot it black and white, I'll hand process the negative, and then we'll post sync it all. And we did. In I think we shot it 2005. No, we didn't. We shot it 2015. And um, 
it was a 44 minute film called Broncos House, which turned out was the most uncommercial length for a film that you could possibly make it. We couldn't get it shown anywhere, but it got the um, attention of Kodak um, and a few other sort of cineasts and film reviewers. I remember um, Mark Kermode happened to see it and um, we met shortly after, well, about around about the same time he saw it and sort of really championed it, although nobody could really see it at that time. But Kodak made us a 35 mil print of it and it suddenly became apparent that the the hunger that I had for seeing films shot on film and not just shot on film, but hand processed and the tactility of film. It was around the same time that Ben Rivers had done Two Years at Sea, which I really loved. Um, it seemed that there was a, a bit of a, an audience for it. And not that I was making films for any particular audience, but it did give me a bit of um, belief that this was an interesting way to go with film. So then I was looking, having made this very uncommercial um, length film, I was then looking for something that we could do as a feature film. And I went back to this film, The Holiday Park, and took out the sort of found footage video diary element of it and wrote it as a straight narrative and then hooked up with Denzel, my producer, went off to do another project. So I hooked up with Kate Byers and Lynn Waite from Early Day Films and they raised the money quite quickly, privately, to, to, to make bait um, in the way that Broncos House had been made, but roughly the same story as the as the Holiday Park, and I kind of thought that it was a really different film. Now, when I look at Bait, I think it bears no resemblance to the Holiday Park. But I've, I've come to realise that because of the full-on conversations about the way that Bait was made, which is sort of a a, a bit of a revelation to people, but not to me because I've been making films like that for quite a while now. I realised that. The Holiday Park was all about the form. It was this found footage film. And actually, Bait, to a certain extent, is about the form as well. So not only is the theme at the heart of The Holiday Park remained in Bait, but the actual reliance on form to tell the story is there, albeit a completely different form. So you've described your previous film as uncommercial, presumably in length and also possibly in content. I don't know exactly what um, whether it was a sort of mini Avengers in 44 minutes or something. But um, <laughs> Bait is also... No. On paper, you would say it's a an un. I mean, it's obviously turned out to be a smash hit, so that kind of goes without saying. But on paper, it's not a com- really a commercial project. Presumably, when they were raising funding for it, how did that process happen? I'm not. I'm not sure. I can't really speak to how the producers raised the money. I mean, it was all privately financed, so I I imagine it was probably lower risk because the budget was small so if the if the film made any kind of money there was a good chance that the investors would make their money back but i think from from what i from what i've heard from you know conversations i've had about about that side of thing i i think with the private finance you have much less i think people kind of looking at it as a as a as a business proposition rather than something uh, rather than the film industry sort of second guessing what might be popular at a certain time um so i think in some ways it might be easier to to get a film green lit with private money than it is with um conventional um so, you know going the conventional ways um and then maybe uh, there's i mean there's huge checks and balances on publicly funded films which you know which there should be because it is it is public money um but that's quite problematic at times because I think we do get into a situation where you're having to create work in a hypothetical sense that has already got an audience attached to it. And actually it's futile. I think it works at a certain level. You know, you mentioned um, Avengers or something then that, you know, I think that with those, with the, with the big budget stuff and the franchises, I think, you know, if you, if you have a decent script, um, you have familiar material, you spend enough money on it, you put the, the the certain amount of A-listers in it and you chuck enough money at the marketing, then you can probably guarantee a profit. I think the amount of profit then becomes the issue of whether a film's a success or not. I don't think many films of that size sort of lose money. Um, so for me, for, for bait, and it's easy to say it now, you know, there was no expectations on 
on bait. Nobody knew we were making it except for us. Nobody was waiting for a black and white hand process 16 millimeter film about Cornish fishermen. But it turned out that's exactly what people wanted. And I think as an audience member, I've had moments like that this last year where I've been traveling to festivals with the film and I've gone to a I've gone to a screening just because I'm at a festival to see a film that I've known nothing about and and come out going, oh, I never realized I needed to watch a two hour long film about the 1980s baby kidnapping cases in Chile. But I did because it's changed my life a little bit. And I think that's the responsibility of the filmmaker. So I think I think that, you know, one thing I've learned is that you really just have to follow your gut. And what I've always said to myself is that if it's a film I want to see and it's and it's, you know, when I finished it, it's still a film that I want to see. There'll be an audience for it of some size. And the, and the thing then is to just be careful. You don't get too bloated with what you're doing. So keep the budget small, keep control of it so that when you that opening night or the premiere at a festival, you introduce a film that you know is every frame you and you'll stand by it there'll be an audience for it and it might not be an avengers style audience and it i don't it never will be for for me but that you know that doesn't that doesn't worry me because i just imagine the compromises that somebody who makes one of those films has to make in order to get it onto the screen i just don't want to you know life's too short and especially now i just when time seems like such a weird concept, I just start thinking, how many films, you know, I'm 44, how many films realistically am I going to make in the rest of my career? And then start thinking, well, I'm, so I'm just going to make the ones I want to make. I'm going to make the films that I want to see and not think about an audience. Because when you're formulating a film, there is no audience. You have to be pretty arrogant or be working at very high end to assume there's already an audience for the work you're going to do. And actually, you know, somebody said, um, I've said this a couple of times recently, somebody said on Twitter when the bait box office went, you know, hit some milestone, you know, because it wasn't expected to take anything at the box office, really. The box office was going to be, the cinema release was just going to be sort of ahead of a, a, an online release, really. And then, the, you know, it just, it was still playing in cinemas when the cinemas closed and it opened at the end of August last year. And somebody on Twitter said the success of bait just reinforces the, the 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 old cliche that nobody knows anything about anything and um straight away underneath somebody replied well clearly bfi distribution do because they so you know they they bought the film and and believed that there was some kind of audience for it so it's it's a great combination of this private finance this this model that was set up by the producers to finance the film and then the other you know complete other end of the spectrum the bfi to then you know the, the sort of custodians of British cinema to then pick it up and and promote it so yeah it's a, it's a strange model and it and it, it works I couldn't really be happier with the way it's gone it's probably one of those things where like on paper if you read a synopsis and a brief description of the craft you'd be like it doesn't make sense and then you only need to sit and watch it for it to make sense it's actually a very crowd pleasing it's not a mainstream film but it has quite i would think a very broad appeal i can't imagine anyone watching it and not getting something out of it so i can see why it works on it it does make sense if you if you watch it it does make sense that bfi watched it and said this is what we want to yeah. do yeah well and i think it's it's a really simple story is one thing you know that if there's been any criticism of it that i've read you know and things like um letterboxd people say you know i'm like you know this is good and this is good you know the story's a bit slight and actually, that's the thing that I've come to be most proud of is that it's, yeah, it's a very simple story. And I've realized that the cinema that I like, there were always such simple stories with complex themes at the heart. And I think that's what Bait is about. You know, it's a very simple A to B story, really. Um, but it's got, but there's a complexity in the theme, which I wasn't necessarily 100% in charge of. You know, you sort of hand it over to the character. You, you kind of write the characters, which are all, are all, to a certain extent, versions of me. And then you hand it over to the actors and they add a little bit to it. And suddenly the themes and the contradictions at the heart of it become more complex. And then you pitch it in two years after you make it, then you pitch it into the into the world. And suddenly, you know, people are saying it's a comment about Brexit or it's about this or it's about that. And and suddenly the complexities at the at the heart of it come to the surface, but aren't confused by a complicated story. You know, and the first look review 
in Berlin last year from Peter Bradshaw said that it was like an episode of EastEnders directed by F.W. Murnau. And, and that was very funny at the time. And now I look at it and think, actually, he was sort of bang on. And, I, and, and I'm as proud of as the EastEnders reference as I am the Murnau reference because it is accessible to everybody you know instead you look at it and think oh this is high art this is wanky this is hipster this is you know whatever label people want to chuck at the film but plot wise it's like a soap opera if we can just take a moment to talk about the craft behind the film because i imagine that you're right. you're bored to tears of um having to justify yourself and explain your decisions there but presumably you made a bit of a rod for your back both practically and financially by choosing to shoot on the bolex which is you know it's presumably a much more tricky you know it's, it's one thing to get a huge you know these huge re cameras and rigs and whatever but you know cheap digital cameras are are perfectly easy to use and these obviously everyone gets an idea of the sense of the texture that that film mm. film affords but what else does it give you what made it so important to you the the, the thing for me with the camera is it's so simple that's that's the thing because you know you say digital cameras are easy to use and all that kind of stuff um but it depends how your brain works and my brain doesn't work in that way so a digital ca- i mean i don't own a, a mobile phone a smartphone or anything like that so i don't film stuff on a on a smartphone because i'm just not interested in the lack of process within that you know i can that for me, shooting something that's so simple and so automated, I might as well look at somebody else's photos, you know, because I'm not doing that. I'm not, there's no, none of me in those photos if I do it digitally. I might as well just go on Google Images and look at, you know, other people's photos of sunsets or whatever. Having said that, you know, I've got an iPad and I do take snaps of stuff as a sort of diary you know, mostly at the moment it's of my cats looking out the window and things like that. That's what my Instagram and is full of. But I, in terms of creating, and sorry to sound, you know, wanky about this, but in, in terms of creating art, unless I'm involved through the process of it, I've got no engagement. I've got no ownership of it as far as I'm concerned. And then that's not a criticism or any comment on the way that other people work. You know, there's plenty of my filmmaking heroes work digitally and then create and put then so much of themselves into into the work you know like somebody like scott barley who shoots on an iphone and then you look at his films and just go well there's you cannot say that every single frame and every single pixel of that has got him in it because he's designed this amazing process it's just i i'm i don't have that's not where my interest is. So for me, film making a film takes so much energy and it takes so much time out of me. You know, that's not even how much it takes out of my collaborators or the producers who are raising the money or anything like that. But just speaking for myself, it, it takes so much energy. So what I've got to do to, to, to keep going, to keep the momentum going is enjoy every single bit of it. So I design a process that I just love. So loading a roll of film into a camera, I couldn't be happier than rolling a, than loading a roll of film into a camera, taking a light meter reading like filmmakers have done since 1895. Um, hand winding the camera, knowing that when I press the shutter, I've got a maximum of 27 seconds to capture this piece of magic and, it, and having to communicate that to everybody. And then when the camera's running, the sound of that camera is constantly communicating that to everybody as a sense of urgency, a sense of focus. Um, then taking the, the roll of film out of the camera and recanning it, knowing that there's this latent image trapped on there that will be there until I process it and it will come to life. And then that, moment of processing it and that image coming to life in front of my eyes for me you know that's the joy of filmmaking i don't want to skip any of that people have said to me why why did you hand process it or why didn't you send it to the lab and i just think why would i let anybody else have that fun you know why would i let why would i and pay them to do it you know 
here, have all of this fun and here's thousands of pounds. You know, I know why film and, and people say, well, it'd be so much quicker. And I say, well, what's the hurry? You know, let's wait, let's do this slow. You know, the, uh, to get the post-production debate done, yeah, I, I processed five miles of, of um, 16 millimeter negative frame by frame. It took me months and I was working six days a week and sometimes I was in the studio 14, 16 hours a day doing it. So I was working absolutely flat out, but every single frame has got a bit of me in there, that handmade process. So, um, yeah, it creates a lot of, it creates a lot of work, but also it's, it, it's whatever the opposite of a false economy is, you know, all the whole, the months I spent processing this film, I was editing it in my head. I was looking at frames of it and thinking, Oh, I could do that with a scene, you know, the edit, which has got a lot of attention, wouldn't be the edit it is now if I'd sent the film off to get, to get processed and got it back and started cutting two days later, because I wouldn't have had that detachment from the film. I would have, I would have made a version of the film. I would have made a version of the script in the edit rather than a version of the footage in the edit. And that's very important for me to, to be making a film out of the footage we've got than, than the script that I had in my head at the beginning. So, um, it's, you know, and financially, it was, it's cheap. It's so cheap to shoot on film. And that sounds like a real privileged thing because, you know, we had, we had, we had um, a lot of support from Kodak and, you know, and who, who, who subsidized quite a bit of the stock. But we only had 128 rolls of film. And that's 100 foot rolls, not even 400 foot cans. So for a... 90 minute a film that's effectively 90 minutes we shot four and a half hours of rushes so i could watch all the rushes when i'd processed it all and and we'd had the the proxy the digital proxies back i watched four and a half hours of footage in the morning when we when i got the drive sent back had my dinner and then in the afternoon watched four and a half rushes four and a half hours of rushes again by the end of that week i had a rough edit of the film so the materiality costs, but the time it saves you by it being in a position where I only shoot one take of everything. I don't shoot coverage. I don't shoot end. There's not endless options in the edit for scenes. Scenes cut together in one way. And if they don't work, the only option I have is to mess with the chronology. I don't go, right, is there another master shot? Is there another reaction shot? I just don't I rule all of that out. So it, it becomes incredibly time cheap even though the, you know, and the camera, the equipment we shot it with was one cam, a camera, the Bolex, which cost me 375 quid. Um, one lens, a light meter and a tripod, um, three lights and a reflector. And that's the kit. So it's, it's so, for me, it's so simple and it's, really cheap and it's very and it's really light touch in terms of the equipment we're using it's presumably one of those things where if everyone was doing it it wouldn't really be viable in in a sense that in a way the eccentricity or the the feel of bait being unusual has been very important and very powerful for it Mm. and if the default for kind of independent filmmakers doing something on the cheap was to use the bolex and hand process everything maybe that magic would have would have gone a little bit yeah yeah so does this i guess this begs for for me the the question of going forward from here you know could you never see yourself directing a project working with a cinematographer or would that be too much like looking at other people's images yeah i did i did a short film after bait called hard crack the wind which was somebody else's script and somebody else dp'd it and i think it was just one thing too many for me giving up both of those roles i think i I think the the project I'm going to do, I mean, actually, we're talking today, it's the 15th today, isn't it? That sounds about right. Yeah. What is time anymore? We, we, yeah. (laughs) We should, today is the first day of principal photography on my next film. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, which has been delayed for a year. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. I forgot it was today. Yeah, so so doing this film with Film 4 called Ennis Main which is a horror film, which was supposed to start shooting today for four weeks. And when we were putting that together, putting the package together, 
it w- it was interesting because it's going to be hand it's going to be shot on the Bolex single lens. Um, it's color, so it is actually going to be lab processed. But there's certain things that I'm going to do to interfere with the negative, to um, so that it's not just a clean process. But it, it but it's set in 1973, so there's a built-in justification for shooting it on on film, because I never thought that with bait. I never thought, oh, you know what's the reason for shooting this? What's the justification for shooting this on film? Because there was, because I didn't need to justify myself to anybody. The producers were behind the decision. Um, it didn't seem to matter to the people funding it. And nobody was waiting for the film. So I wasn't thinking, oh, what are the audience going to think? Because there was no audience. I would, you know, I wasn't thinking, ne- I never think about the audience. So it was a kind of relief that then in Berlin, or it was, it was at least quite, illuminating in Berlin at the premiere when somebody in the Q&A said to me it's it's you know said it's so great that you've um made a film about this dying industry this dying way of life and you've shot it on this sort of dying format and I thought I never thought of that you know and of course I then adopted that as my reason for doing it so the q a the next night in berlin somebody said you know what what was your thinking behind this film i said well i want to make a, a film about a dying way of life and i decided to do it with this form that everybody thinks is dying out and it became the reason for doing it maybe somewhere in my subconscious that was the reason for doing it but but i never thought about it but now i'm thinking oh what's the you know what is what's the justification for making this this horror, and I think, oh, it was shot in 1973, so we'll shoot it on, on a, on colour neg, we'll, um, we'll shoot it on a colour neg that was a, that was similar to the neg they would have been shooting on in 1973, so I looked at things like, you know, Don't Look Now, and, and that kind of era of, of, um, of genre filmmaking, and it's, um, and I've got a justification for it, and then there's, um, and, also, and that's gone like one step further in terms of the sound going, well, actually the 5.1 mix that we've been doing tests with for the new film. It's just chucked out. Check that out. Let's just go mono. Let's, let's, you know, let's, let's go, let's fully embrace the form. Let's not hide the form. Let's, you know, and, and I, you know, and you'd look at something like the lighthouse, which is all, mono I'm thinking, of course it is you know the, the ancient ratio of course the audio is going to be mono and just really celebrate the form in that way the film after that that I'm going to do which I've had in development for a while is about an artist um, and I'm going to use glass mats and hand painted sections in it and stuff so again I can the form's going to be part of it so it's set from sort of the the 1860s up to the 1940s so up until the 1920s, it's going to be black and white hand processed. From the 1920s onwards, it's going to be a t- the old two strip um, process. So again, the form is all part of it. There's a film. There's a there's a film. A script that I'm writing now, which is set um, in the modern day, but also in 1991. So I'm thinking, can I? justify the thought and I think well yeah of course because if there's a film being made in 1991 and it was shot on 16 millimeter it would look like a film that I'm that I would shoot so um yeah it, it seems like period drama is the way I'm going at the moment not costume drama but kind of you know that and it and it's great because it allows you the complexities of storytelling um and dramatic conventions to and mystery to be able to thrive in a world where there aren't, uh, where there isn't the internet and mobile phones, which is, which is quite liberating else. Everything else, all, all mysteries can be solved in a, in a second. This, this is quite, quite kind of an impertinent question. So forgive me, but do you not have a slight fear that you will be pigeonholed as, you know, we go to Mark to do his hand processed artisan filmmaking and, you know, maybe you'll you miss the call for the, for something else that might be completely creatively fulfilling or, or is this just how you want to make films and you're lucky enough to, that you've had a success that is going to allow you to do that for as long as you want to? I was going to say, you know, nobody comes knocking anyway, so it's not a case of turning people down. But actually since Bait 
I have had a couple of offers for bigger films, but they've they've sort of been um, on the on the proviso that they would allow me to work in the way that I work to a certain extent. But I've been offered a couple of quite big projects that, aside from the way that I want to work, um, aren't right for me because they're just too big. And I wouldn't have the creative control, you know, whether we were making it in a more conventional way or making it the way that I want to make work. Either way, the amount of control that I like to have is just not possible with those budget levels. So I remember, I remember um, Mark Kermode saying to me, um, he did a, he introduced a screening at the BFI um, la last year. And he, I remember him saying to me, you do realize now that you're going to get offered a Star Wars film. And, you know, I, I, I know that he was joking, but his point being that people are going to, I'd suddenly become attractive to people who want to do something, who, who want their stuff to maybe be slightly different. The problem being that, in my experience, you get into those situations, and actually people say they want, something different but when push comes to shove they want something different as long as it's exactly the same and um i'm quite wary of i'm quite wary of that but i'm you know i'm the film that i do the film that i'm writing at the moment is going to need a bigger budget to get it produced um i think and and as long as the form doesn't become the entire focus of the film then um then then i think it will be okay i think once once the form becomes everything you're quite often you're then you're in the world of capital e experimental avant-garde non-narrative cinema which i love but it's not you know that's not where this work should sit what i don't like is is or not it's not i don't like it. i like plenty of commercially commercial film conventionally made films but the films that i really like are the films that acknowledge the form as well and don't hide the form don't pretend that you're not looking at a, at a film i like films that remind you every so often that you're looking at a film because i think it's disconcerting for the audience and it engages the audience so i think it's a balance you know there's got to be a justification for how you make a film i i, I sort of do a bit of um, mentoring of students and i kind of tell them that they've got to they've got to establish a work in practice that inspires them you know don't second guess what other people are going to going to want because you'll end up with things that are derivative or things that you yourself don't believe in them and if you don't believe in them nobody's going to believe in them so it's not a case of encouraging everybody to make films in the way that i make films but it's a, but i like to encourage people to try and develop a way of working whereby they'll have the passion and the energy to see films through because like i said before it takes it takes a lot of energy and you've really got to you've got to really wake up each morning excited about what you're doing else um you know because nobody else is going to power it through yeah okay one final question bait is sort of have the support of you know what is almost i guess the holy trinity of sort of british institutions and in sort of bfi bafta and um mark kermode <laughs> so what do you think have been your kind of experiences from that as feeling like your film has been championed and kind of i guess more broadly what can british film do better to support kind of independent filmmakers people making films outside the studio industrial complex and sort of doing things different from 99 percent of things that pass through our cinemas i i don't know I've, i suppose what i've learned is that how easy it seemed to be to kind of get to where the film got. And that was nothing to do with me. All of my hard work and my collaborators hard work was put in up until the point where the film is finished. And that's not to say that, you know, the producers then worked really hard to get the distribution deal and, 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 um, and get the film out there. But actually the, from the moment it got its first review, the ball just seemed to roll. And I think, you know, very awful, clumsy analogy, but I think we, you know, you steer the ball to a certain extent, um, but it just picked up so much pace. So 
I, I'm sort of it demystified everything for me. You just go, well, you make a a good film, whatever the hell good means, but you make a good film, there'll be an audience, there'll be critical acclaim, there'll be awards. That's what happens. But that only happens to a tiny percentage of films, of good films, because so many films just don't get seen. And we were so lucky. And I keep saying this, and, and I keep saying this all the time. We were so lucky. We were so lucky that Peter Bradshaw wrote that the first look review in Berlin that got us so much attention because we were in Forum in Berlin. And a lot of films in Forum don't get reviewed. Um, and don't have well attended press screenings and that kind of stuff. But, and, and I think Peter Bradshaw didn't, he saw it on a screener anyway. He didn't see it at, at the press screening even. And he wrote this brilliant first look review, but the reason, and then he talked about it again. You know, he did a video blog that a lot of people saw that he said, Oh, you know, this film, you know, and this was, and the reason he talked about it so much was because it was in the context of him saying that the first week of that Berlin Alley last year, he thought the films were crap. So if the films had all been great, he might not have talked about bait and the ball wouldn't have started rolling. Um, you know, we had extra screenings put on in Berlin. Every screening sold out. We had an extra press screening. We would just review, you know, and we came back from Berlin on this wave of, of um, support and sort of acclaim um, that might not have happened if the, if the circumstances had been slightly different. What, what if we'd been programmed in, this, in, you know, in the second week? We might have been lost in amongst the the films that were received better. Um, the fact that people picked up that this film was a Brexit film and suddenly there was a hook to hang this film on. I didn't make a Brexit film. We didn't make a Brexit film. We never mentioned Brexit when we were making the film. The film was written 20 years ago. Now, you could argue that um, Brexit was 20 years ago. That was when Brexit, the the result of Brexit was set in stone 20 years ago with the alienation of working people in this country and the demonization of the other, you know, attention away from Westminster, there to blame these people, are to, you know, all of that. Maybe that was 20 years ago. So maybe it was a Brexit film, but we certainly didn't do that consciously. So that was amazing timing. So all of these things, you know, um, Mark, the reason Mark Kermode saw Bronco's house, which is where me and him first met, was because he happened to play um, guitar and sing at a warehouse party in Newlyn, which I was at, and took a photo of him. <laughs> and it, and a, a medium format hand processed photo, which just came out brilliantly. So I just gave him a shout on Twitter and said, I've got this photo of you. Do you want a print of it? And he, and he loved the photo and I sent him this print and, um, and then he ended up seeing Bronco's house because of that. Now, I'd, what if I hadn't have gone to that party, you know, and, and you can say that about everything, you know, you can say that what my mum and dad didn't meet, you know, I wouldn't exist, but so it's, it's sort of ridiculous talking this way, but it's kind of, now that the coronavirus thing has kicked off, you see the flip side of that. So in, we were due to be in, to go to South by Southwest with bait, with, with um, Gweno, who's done the new live score, which, we, which has been performed once at the NFT. It was supposed to be at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, which obviously got canceled. So we didn't go and do that, which was a real shame, but it was a, it was a kind of separate, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, our world premiere or anything. So for us, it wasn't, um, in terms of the success of the film, it wasn't a big deal, but so many people had, were scheduled to have their world premieres at that festival. And that's gone, you know, can gone, all of these festivals gone. So it might sound ridiculous me saying all of these, this luck that you have to have, um, but it's true because look at the bad luck people are having now. Look at the films that were shut down halfway through shooting or the films that were shut down just as the financiers were just about to sign over the money to producers. You know, again, we've been so lucky with this new film, which we were supposed to start shooting today because I, de I think the deal was in place. You know, 
who were ready to go, but we hadn't started spending any money. We hadn't started. So again, we've just la- you know been so lucky landing in this sweet spot. And I and as an audience member, I just think the success of Bait has been great. But it also makes me realise how many amazing films are there out there that I don't get to see because they don't have the luck of timing. And we might have terrible luck um, with the new one. You know, I mean, we might not even ever get it made <laughs> because of the situation we're in. Or maybe we get it made and we we are, you know, and we, and we get a premiere at Cannes next year and it's and it's programmed against something that everybody wants to go to. Or we have a technical problem or, you know, mm-hmm. the shorter answer to your question is what I've learned is that, yeah, you you have to have a good film to get the success. But having a good film doesn't mean that you'll get the support of critics, you know, distributors or award givers. You need a huge amount of luck on top of that, which is, which is, which makes me really grateful of thankful for what's happened, but also makes me very wary of, of the future and and not to become complacent. Brilliant. Well, this is, this has been so great. Thank you for speaking to me. No pleasure. Nick. It was yeah. Good, good to chat. And just before you go, it would be remiss of me not to note that Bay is available on DVD and Blu-ray, also streaming on BFI Player at the moment. And you can also access BFI Player as a sort of add-on subscription through Amazon Prime Indie. They actually have a 30-day free trial, which is perfect for this time. And then maybe you'll want to subscribe for more. I can't possibly say. Anyway, you should watch Bay. Thanks for listening and don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and please leave us a review there if you've listened this far. If you've listened this far, you're clearly a huge fan. Please leave us a five-star review and say some kind words and it helps people find us. And you can also listen on Spotify, tune in, all those various places. And if you're interested in advertising on the podcast, drop me a line at nick at podopods, that's P-O-D-O-T-P-O-D-S dot com and we can have a chat about that. Thanks for listening and speak to you soon. <laughs>